Hey, welcome to First Baptist Church Online. We're so glad you've cho chosen to join us today. Uh, as we get together this week and, and next week, our pastor begins a two-part series to help you understand how a bicycle and discipleship go together. You go, huh, how does a bicycle and discipleship go together? Well, stay tuned and, lo and stay, stay locked in and you're gonna find out how those go together. Just understand that as you ride a bicycle, it requires a balance. And so does our process of making disciples. So I'll start you off with that. Uh, and as we get ready for our pastor to come, I want you to grab your notebook and pen, and of course, your copy of God's word. And we're going to pray together uh, as he comes this morning. Lord, we thank you for today that we can come together to worship, that we can engage with your word and you'll grow us and challenge us and change us through it. As we look through scripture at what it is to make disciples and we better understand it, we can use the illustration of a bicycle to understand uh, the things we need to be about in discipleship. Today, Lord, we also want to just pray together for our country, pray for our nation as we have just passed yesterday the, uh, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 the attacks on our nation. With all that is going on around the world, both uh, in Afghanistan as we have Americans uh, getting out of that country and, and all that's happening there, but also for our friends in the southern part of our country across Louisiana and Mississippi, and all the places have been devastated in the last week with flooding due to the hurricane and, and just how you provide. We're so excited about how, uh, how people work together to help people. And as Southern Baptists, we get to be a part of that work through all the different ministries that we partner to do. We thank you for letting us be a part of that, for how you're going to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me for today's service from First Baptist Church in Rock Hill. I don't know about you, but I enjoy riding bicycles, especially when we vacation at the beach because it's, well, flat, and I like that better than riding them uphill. And I know a lot of people ride bicycles. It's a very popular activity today, and, and you know, they have two pedals. And if you've ever tried to ride one, just push one pedal, you don't, you don't get very far. You lose your momentum, and you, you begin to slow down. And I want you to have that image in your mind as I preach today because I want to talk about momentum in the church and momentum in your life as a follower of Christ. That, that as a church family, we have two pedals we need to be pushing simultaneously and pushing as hard as we can to keep momentum going forward. And the same thing is true in your life. As an individual follower of Jesus, there are two pedals I'm going to talk about today that you need to be pushing at the same time and pushing them hard. And, and, and the reason is there's a spiritual principle revealed in Scripture. And this spiritual principle is this, that we are either moving forward or we are slowing down, never standing still. You're either moving forward or slowing down. And if you continue to slow down, eventually you'll stop altogether and fall over. That's true in your life as a follower of Christ, your spiritual life. You're either moving forward or you're slowing down. And it's true for us as a church as well. We're either moving forward or slowing down and moving toward falling over. So today and next Sunday, I want to talk about that because it's the last thing. Listen to this. It's the last thing Jesus mentioned to his disciples following his crucifixion and resurrection just before he ascended back to the Father in heaven. He said it this way in Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He describes the two pedals here. Listen to what he said. He said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, Jesus starts his final instruction to the disciples, to his church, to his followers, to you and me, with the word go, which has the idea of motion and movement and momentum and progress. And in these two verses, Jesus describes the two pedals we have to continually push if we're going to have momentum in our spiritual life and momentum in our church. Verse 19 is one pedal, and verse 20 is the second pedal. Now, to help you understand what Jesus means here, 
I have to to address or clear up a misunderstanding, if you will, because Jesus said, go and make disciples. Now, here's the misunderstanding. Here's the problem. When the average Christian hears the word, make disciples, we think about spiritual growth. That's where our mind automatically goes, growing stronger as a Christian, going deeper in the word. We say you get saved, and then you are discipled. Discipleship happens. And and. In our minds and in our thinking, we limit discipleship to the spiritual growth that takes place after someone is saved, the growth that takes place after someone becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. The problem is that's wrong. That's not the biblical way of understanding discipleship. When the Bible talks about making disciples, it includes the whole process from being lost to becoming a follower of Christ and then being baptized and growing as a Christian and then turning around and helping others who do not know Jesus become connected to Jesus. It's the whole process. In the New Testament, when people began following Jesus, they were called disciples. Now we talk about the 12 disciples, but that's just because they were the 12 disciples he selected for a special relationship with him and he trained them in a special way. But in the New Testament, Each person, each person who followed Jesus Christ, each person who had been born again into the family of God is called a disciple. That's the reason our church and many other churches in this country define a disciple this way. We say a disciple is three things. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who, as they follow him, is being transformed or changed by Jesus Christ And they are on mission. They are on mission with Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ. And so literally, when he said, go make disciples, Jesus is speaking to me and to you, to the church, and to each and every person who is saved, each and every person who follows Jesus, each and every person who is a disciple, because all believers, all followers are disciples. And he's saying to each of us, now you... Go and make disciples of others who are not yet disciples. You go and make disciples of those who are lost. Make disciples of those who are disconnected from God. That's the reason we say here at First Baptist Rock Hill, we exist to make disciples. That's our purpose. That's our reason for being. We exist to make disciples. Now, Making disciples, which all of us are supposed to be doing, has two parts to it. I'm describing them today as the two pedals of a bicycle. Verse 19 is one pedal, verse 20 is the other pedal. The two pedals that we have to push simultaneously and we have to push equally hard if we're going to keep the momentum going forward in our spiritual lives and in our church life, making disciples. Two parts to it. And if we don't push both metal, both pedals, we're going to lose momentum. You will lose momentum in your walk with Jesus. This church will lose momentum if we don't continually push both of those two pedals. So what are those two pedals we have to push? Well, verse 19 is one of the pedals. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, most people think of that as evangelism. That's that's the word that we commonly use. Here at our church, we talk a lot about engaging lostness. How do we, who are the followers of Christ, his disciples, get out into the world and engage lostness, engage with people who are far from God, disconnected from Him. Evangelism, engaging lostness. That's what he's talking about in verse 19 when he says, make disciples and then baptize them. The second pedal is verse 20 when he talks about teaching them to observe all the things that I have taught you. Now, that's the one that historically we call discipleship, but it's just one part of discipleship. Here at our church, we, t- we, we, we refer to that as growing as disciples, growing disciples, maturing as disciples. It's that not only following Jesus, see, the first part, that evangelism, that engaging lostness means that we help people become followers of Christ. That's the first pedal of disciples, of making disciples. And then the second one is helping people to grow in that relationship, to be transformed, changed to grow and then be on mission, be evangelist, 
go out and make disciples of others who are lost. Those are the two pedals. And let me, let me help you understand how those two work together. Because just like riding the bicycle, you're pushing them both at the same time if you want a smooth and, and good ride. In the church, we have to do the same thing, push them both. Here's how it works. We engage lostness. We're in relationships with people. We're serving and loving people who are disconnected from God and, and, and they become believers. They come to faith in Christ and then they are baptized. And after that, we help them grow spiritually. We help them mature in their, in their walk with Jesus and become more like Christ so that they in turn go back out into the world and engage lostness and they help others become followers of Christ, disciples, be, be people of faith and they help them grow. And this process just keeps repeating itself. And so it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Both of those happening simultaneously. Both of those happening all the time. Now here's the problem. Too many churches and too many Christians are only pushing one of those pedals. And as a result, momentum, spiritual momentum is being lost for the kingdom of God. Think about somebody who only pushes the pedal of evangelism, a Christian who only does evangelism, a church who only does evangelism. And so you'll see people, as they engage lostness, you'll see people making decisions to believe in Jesus Christ, but so many of them, the majority of them don't stick. They don't last. Because all that church is doing, all that disciple is doing is engaging lostness, doing evangelism. That's the only pedal they're pushing. And so people are going out the back door as fast as they're coming in the front door. And then there are others, and truthfully there are more, who are guilty of only pushing the second pedal. The pedal of spiritual growth. The pedal of what they normally call discipleship, spiritual growth. And if you're only pushing that pedal and you're not pushing much on the engaging lostness pedal, then, then what we talk about going deep in the Word of God and really getting close in our relationship with Jesus. But the result is we tend to turn inward on ourselves. And we don't look out into the world and see the field that is white to harvest. We don't engage lostness. And so, yes, we're going deep and we love each other and we have all these good Bible studies, but nobody's getting saved or very few people are being saved. And Jesus is not happy with either of those. Jesus wants us to push both pedals. He wants us to engage lostness and he wants us to help people grow spiritually so that they in turn can become disciple makers. In fact, that's what he commanded us to do in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 when he said, go make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them to observe how to not only obey but to do Everything I've taught you and the process just keeps going. That is Jesus' commandment to each of us. In fact, me and you, each of us as believers, as disciples of Jesus, are commanded by Jesus in these two verses to be involved in this process of making disciples, which includes the pedal of engaging lostness and the pedal of helping people grow to the point of being mature disciples who turn around and then they engage lostness. We are to be involved in that whole process. That little word, G-O, go, is an active word. It's not passive. And it means we are to be intentional. Now, what scares us is that this world can be a very scary place. Yes, we know the world is beautiful. There's so much beauty in life and so much beauty in this world. But man, there's a lot of ugliness too. And it can be a, a scary place. Yesterday our nation was remembering 9-11 and, and the terrorist attack and then all the events that had been taking place in Afghanistan in recent months reminding us of how dangerous and how ugly and how scary this world can be. Even here in our own country, we understand there are so many people and so many groups that are opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to Christians speaking publicly about their faith. We look around our country and we see that our, our moral compass is broken and we call right what is wrong and we call wrong what is right. And all of that world scares us. And as disciples, rather than going into the world and making disciples, we, we too often fall prey to one of two temptations. One of those temptations is to retreat, to withdraw, 
to isolate ourselves, if you will, in our Christian cocoon away from the lostness and the darkness of this world and not having relationships with people and, 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 and investing in people's lives and loving them and serving them and, and drawing them to Christ. We retreat and we hide and we stay just within our Christian circles. The other temptation is to fight, to go on the attack, to be militant. And quite often you'll see this people who are very engaged in politics and trying to get laws passed. And the problem is that, that there are too many in our churches, if they're not retreating into their spiritual cocoons, they are attacking the world and not in love, but in hate. They know more about about politics than they, they, they do Jesus. They know more about the legislature than they do the word of God. And neither of those approaches work. Neither of those fulfill the, the great commission that Jesus gave us here to go and make disciples and baptize and, and teach them to observe all of his teachings. They don't, they don't fulfill that. We, he, he says, you've got to go. You can't retreat. You can't hide. You have to go. You have to engage. But when we go, we must also go in love. You remember Jesus not only gave the great commission, which is this passage, he also gave us the great commandment when he said, love the Lord your God. This is the greatest commandment of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said the second greatest commandment is similar to that one, to love your neighbor as yourself, to love God and love people, and then here, go and make disciples. So as we go and make disciples, we have to do it in love. And militancy is not going in love. Recently in uh, one of my D groups, Brother David Hamilton is in my group. And, and that particular week we had been reading in Timothy where, uh, where the Apostle Paul uh, told Timothy to teach people to pray, to pray for kings and rulers and all who are in authority. And David was sharing about that in our weekly gathering as a D group. And he said when he, he, he read that, he found it hard to do. And, and he started thinking about those early believers in the first century because Paul was instructing them to pray for their kings and their rulers. And that would include Nero who persecuted Christians. They, they were to pray for those evil Roman empires. And, and David said, you know, I struggle with that because I don't like a lot of what's going on in our world today, in our country today. I don't like everything our president is doing. And, and so I struggled with that. And I imagine they did. But then he said, but I made myself pray for our president and for leaders in our country because that's what the Bible says I'm supposed to do. And after I prayed for them, he said something happened. I felt different on the inside. It affected me. It impacted me. See, brothers and sisters, hear me. You and I are never going to be effective at making disciples, at engaging lostness, if we don't allow Jesus Christ to teach us how to love lost people. If we don't allow Jesus to teach us how to love the people in this world who are disconnected from God, who don't have our value system, who believe differently than we do, if we don't learn how to love people far from God, we are never going to be able to adequately obey Jesus' command to push both pedals, to engage lostness, to make disciples, and then help them grow and become disciple makers themselves. That's the reason in our worship center here at First Baptist, there are three large banners hanging on the wall. That's our purpose statement, our reason for existing. We say that we exist and it's biblical. We exist to love God, to love people, and make disciples. And pushing both of those pedals is part of fulfilling that great commandment and great commission we received individually and collectively as the followers of Christ. Now let me ask you to do something. Let me ask you to do a little self-evaluation. If you could picture yourself riding a bicycle right now, and here's these uh, two pedals, and riding that bicycle smoothly and quickly without stopping, without falling, riding that bicycle well is a picture of you being a maturing, growing disciple, follower of Jesus who is engaging lostness and helping them become disciples who become disciple makers. How well are you doing? How well are you riding the bicycle? How well are you pushing those two pedals? How hard are you pushing the pedal of engaging lostness? 
How hard are you pushing the pedal of helping others to grow as disciples and become disciple makers? Are you pushing one of those pedals, both of those pedals, or neither of those pedals? How are you doing? Well, next Sunday, I want to talk about the pedal of growing disciples, of spiritual development. But today, in the minutes I have remaining, I want to say just a brief word about engaging lostness, that one pedal, that one pedal of going and making disciples by engaging lostness, what we normally think of as evangelism. Look at verse 19 again in Matthew 28. He said, go, go and make disciples and baptize them. That's the pedal of engaging lostness. And let's be honest, okay? Let's just, let's, just be, let's just be completely honest. Most of us, if we're honest, don't push that pedal very much, if ever at all. We're afraid. We don't know what to say. We're afraid of how people will react. It makes us uncomfortable. We're intimidated. Some of us are very, very shy. Some don't know the Bible. And so we don't even know what to say to somebody because we don't know the Bible. And so listen, I'm not, I'm not asking you as your first step to go out and share the gospel of Jesus with someone who's lost. I want to, I want to give you another first step. A first step that I believe is an easy step that each and every believer can take, a step that you can take. Now, just because it's easy does not mean it's not important. It is important, and it is very powerful. And eventually, if you take this first step, it will lead to more steps. It's like every journey. Every journey begins with the first step. And if you will take this first easy, very easy, but powerful and important step, it will lead to more steps down the road. It's a great place to start. Are you ready? Are you ready to hear what that first step that I'm challenging you to take so that you can push the pedal of engaging lostness as a follower of Christ? Are you ready? That first pedal, that first step, that first step that I'm asking you to take right now is this, to pray every day. To pray every day. It doesn't get much more simple than that. Nothing intimidating about it. To pray Every day, I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter chapter uh, nine. He's out one day, and in verse thirty-five of Matthew nine, we're told that he that he was going through different cities and villages, teaching people, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God, and healing people. Meaning, he was ministering to their needs. And in verse thirty-six, his experience is described this way: It says that seeing the people. He felt compassion for them. It's like I said a moment ago, until you and I allow Jesus to teach us to love people who are messed up and hurting, love people who know nothing about the Bible or God, love people who are far from Jesus, disconnected. Oh, we need compassion and love. Jesus saw them and he felt compassion for them. And then here's what he said to his followers in verse 37. And he's saying it to you and me because we too are his followers. Verse 37, he, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. It's like a, a garden that's ready to be harvested, a crop that's coming. He said, there are so many people in this world who are ready for the gospel, who are ready for the kingdom, who are ready for a relationship with Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. There just aren't very many of us pushing that pedal of engaging lostness. We're either attacking or hiding instead of pushing the pedal of engaging lostness and making disciples. He said, but there's just not enough workers. Then in verse 38, he continued, here's what I want you to do. Therefore, beseech or ask or pray. Beseech the Lord, pray to the Lord, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus is saying that a foundational step to engaging lostness is prayer. The apostle Paul understood that and he practiced that and we see that in his writings in the New Testament. When he wrote his letter to the believers in the city of Colossae in Colossians chapter 4 verses 3 and following, he said this, he, he's, he's talking to the believers in that day. He said, praying at the same time for us as well. He's saying, will you Colossian Christians pray for me and those who are part of my ministry team? And here's what he asked them to pray about. That God will open up to us a door for the word. 
so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. Will you pray that God opens a door, gives us an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then in verse 4, he said, And that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Pray for me to have an opportunity and pray for me to speak clearly and speak well when I speak. He also wrote in the letter of Ephesians to those believers asking them to pray for him in chapter 6, verse 19. And he said to them, Pray on my behalf. Here's how I want you to pray for me. That utterance may be given to me. That utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness, with boldness, the mystery of the gospel. Paul said, would you pray that God will give me opportunities and that I'll have the boldness to speak and I'll be able to speak with clarity. Pray for me that I can push the pedal of evangelism, that I can push the pedal of engaging lostness, he's saying. So here's what I want to give you. I want to give you three things to pray for Every day. And I hope you'll get out a piece of paper and, some, and a pen or a pencil right now and write these down. Here's three suggestions for you. Three prayers I'm asking you to pray every day as a first step in learning how to push the pedal of engaging lostness. And, and this, these, these three prayers are easy, but they're powerful. It's easy to pray these but it will change you and it will lead to other steps down the road. But, but write these three things down, th these three prayers. Here's the first prayer that I'm challenging you. And if you're somebody who's scared to open your mouth and talk to anybody about Jesus, you've never shared the story of your personal salvation, you've never shared the gospel, I'm asking you to pray these three prayers. Here's the first prayer, okay? Every day, pray, God, just, just ask him, just ask him, God, will, will you give me an opportunity today? I pray, God, that you will give me an opportunity today to say something about you to someone who doesn't know you. God, will you give me an opportunity today to invite someone to church? Give me an opportunity today to speak a good word about you today to somebody who doesn't go to church. So every day pray, God, give me an opportunity today. That's what Paul was doing when he said, would you pray that we'll have an open door? Here's the second prayer I'm asking you to pray. So every day pray, God, give me an opportunity this day to have a gospel conversation. Prayer number two, okay? Pray for lost people. Pray for people who are not connected to Jesus Christ by name. And I want to encourage you to develop what I'm going to call a top five list. A list of five people in your life who are not connected to Jesus. And every day, you're going to pray for those five people by name. And, and let me add a qualifier. I encourage you to only have two names on your list of five, only two, who are relatives. The other three, co-workers, classmates, neighbors, friends, teammates. You say, I don't know five people not connected. You pray for God to reveal five people to you, and he will. So every day, God, give me an opportunity this day to have a gospel conversation. Every day, pray for those five people by name who are not yet connected to Jesus to come to faith in Jesus. And then here is the third and final prayer. Pray every day, God, will you give me courage to stand up for Jesus? Will you give me courage to stand up for Jesus? I don't want to be ashamed. Give me courage. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, if you'll pray those three prayers every day, God, give me an opportunity this day to say something. God, I'm praying for these five people by name to come to faith in Jesus. And God, I'm praying today that you give me boldness and you give me courage. If you pray those three prayers every day, God will change you. God will teach you how to push that pedal of engaging lostness. You will, <clears throat> you will grow in your relationship with Christ and God will answer those prayers and he'll give you opportunities. You'll begin to see opportunities that in the past you never knew were there. You'll begin to take advantage of opportunities that come your way and you will see God at work in your life and through you. Will you commit right now to write down those three prayers and every day pray those three prayers for yourself. 
Pudi Sock was born in America, grew up in America, but her parents were immigrants from Cambodia and they were Buddhist. She thought of herself as a Buddhist and uh, she thought of Christianity as just a religion for Americans only. In 2008, she enrolled as a freshman at the University of Texas in Austin and she said when she went to college that one of her goals was to develop a lot of deep, very meaningful, strong friendships and she did that. Some of those friends that she met happened to be devout followers of Jesus. They were disciples of Jesus Christ. And they would pray for her. And they would talk to her about Jesus. They, were, they would invite her to church, invite her to a campus ministry event. And eventually she told them, would you all stop praying for me and just leave me alone? Quit it. Stop praying for me. By her sophomore year of college, she hit a wall. She, uh, she said nothing gave her meaning in life. That, that she knew life had to have some purpose, it had to have some meaning. And all the things that her Christian friends had said to her, to her it just seemed like foolishness. But there was a, a moment that year when she prayed and asked God to help her at least understand, try to understand what her Christian friends were, were saying to her. And one night, she agreed to go to a campus ministry with some of her friends. And... Uh, the building where the campus ministry met had a small room in it that was a, a, a prayer room. And so she decided to go in there and check it out and she saw a bowl in that prayer room. And in the bowl were these little slips of paper with names on them. Each of those names was a name that, that one of those Christian students had written because it was, it was a friend, it was a friend who was not connected to Jesus, a friend who was not a disciple, a friend who was lost and they were praying for them. And what really got her attention was that her name was on several of those pieces of paper. And when she saw that, she just started crying. Because she remembered, she knew how strongly she had told them to stop praying for me. Quit that. Don't pray for me anymore. And yet they loved her enough to keep praying for her. The following evening, as God softened her heart, she gave her life to Christ. And Pudi Sock became a disciple of Jesus Christ who then grew spiritually and started helping others become disciples. You may be afraid or intimidated from doing a lot of things, but you can pray. You can find that quiet place in your house and you can pray. And every morning you can pray, God, today give me an opportunity to say something to somebody who doesn't know you. Every day you can pray for that list of five people who need Jesus Christ. And every morning you can pray, God, give me the courage today to stand for Jesus. If you do that, I promise you God's going to teach you how to push that pedal of engaging lostness. Please write down those three prayers and begin praying them every day. Begin today. God bless you. Look forward to being with you next Sunday and we'll talk about the other pedal.